Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a few more minutes to join. So hold on to your seats. Hello, everyone. We're just going to give it a few more minutes so everyone's had a chance to join. Okay, let's kick off. Thanks, thanks again, everyone, for joining us for this, um, the first of two sessions, which is going to look at the role for pasture-fed practices in the UK dairy industry. The first one here tonight, and the second one is going to be next week at the Groundswell Agriculture Conference, and we hope to see many of you there. Today's session specifically is going to look at the case for pasture-fed in dairy from a scientific standpoint, the reasons why farmers and retailers should be interested in this topic. The session next week at Groundswell will feature the farmers and it's there that we're going to explore the more practical issues that come with trying to make these changes. I'm Jimmy Woodrow, the Executive Director of the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association. The PFLA is a non-profit membership organisation comprised of farmers, butchers, chefs, vets, academics and many more food and farming professionals that promotes pasture-fed practices in the UK for the environmental animal welfare and human nutritional benefits that this brings. Groundswell is an annual conference now in its fifth year that provides a forum for farmers and others to learn about the theory and practical application of conservation and regenerative agriculture. The PFLA itself has created a set of certification standards known as Pasture for Life, which verifies animals that are only eating grass and forage and no grain. I should add here, that the purpose of these sessions is not a hard sell for pasture for life. We're very aware of the difficulties that dairy farmers have in making such changes and only have a small number of dairy farms currently certified. So these sessions are designed to start a conversation with the industry to explore how we can make progress together. We have an expert panel with us tonight. We're first going to hear from Mike Tame, a ruminant nutritionist who's had a long career in this sector from both within the conventional industry to more recently roles in the organic and pasture fed movements. Hannah Davis is a lecturer at the University of Newcastle, where she focuses on the impact of livestock management on the nutritional quality of meat and milk. Becky Wilson, who sadly can't be here tonight, but comes to us pre-recorded, is the project manager at Farm Carbon Toolkit and will speak about the impact on carbon emissions of maximizing forage feeding. Finally, Bronwyn Percival, cheese buyer at Neil's Yard Dairy and co-author with her husband Francis of Reinventing the Wheel, will talk about the connection between feed and flavour and the marketing opportunities for pasture-fed dairy. I will finally say that our Q&A will come at the end of the webinar and please put your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat, where you can just chat between yourselves. I think I've spoken for long enough, so Mike, over to you to kick us off. Uh, thanks, uh, Jimmy. Um, I'll go on to my screen share. Um, right. Um, I'll just say kick off by stating a little bit about uh, my back. Do, do you want to press play quickly? Oh, sorry. Great. Thank you. Um, I can't find it. Just at the top of your screen there. Bit, yeah. No. There I haven't got it. Left a bit. Up a bit. No, no, no. It's, it's on the it's on the grey panel um, at the top of the keynote. Oh, beg your pardon. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. If you press, if you press play, play sideshow. That's that will work. Thank you. Sorry about that. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Just a little bit more about uh, my background. I started um, off in my career as a researcher with uh, Unilever Research Animal Feed Division, 
um, and followed that by moving into industry uh, to Bibi Agriculture, where I became a senior technical manager for them for a few years. Um, following that, I was set up a consultancy business, um, which I ran and, and still run as my own um, business. In the late 1990s, uh, I became interested in organic agriculture um, and worked with the Organic Research Centre for a few years um, alongside the consultancy. Um, and then in 2001, along with three others, set up Abacus Organic Services, providing um, advice and services to the uh, organic farming world. Um, joined PFLA about eight years ago and then became a member of their certification committee um, about five or six years ago. Um, and I wanted to kick off uh, tonight really with um, a little bit about room and function. Um, I'm sure you're all very well aware uh, that the rumen um, is actually the site where the structural materials of uh, plants, the hemicelluloses and celluloses, uh, are digested. Uh, but the point I want to make about this is that this digestion is pH dependent. Um, the optimal pH for digestion of fiber is around about 6.5 to 6.8, perhaps a little bit wider than this. But if the pH starts to drop, the digestion of fiber begins to slow down and it's significantly lower um, at a pH of six. And if the pH falls to, to 5.6 or below, um, digestion of fiber effectively stops. Um, now, this is not really what you want at all because uh, fibrous materials, grasses and so on, are by far the cheapest feed source uh, for ruminants. Now, if we look at pasture for life, animals that are fed 100% fibre, um, the pH is much more stable and will remain around the 6.5 to 6.8 for most of the day. It will vary a little bit depending on what the animal has eaten, um, what the sugar content of the uh, of the grasses um, is, and how often it eats. But the pH will be relatively stable. Um, if we go on to the next um, slide and look at the other end of the scale, um, a typical TMR ration for high yielding dairy cows where something around 20% of the dry matter is from grass silage, 20% of the dry matter from maize silage, around 30% of the 35% of the dry matter from cereals, and quite possibly 10% around about that level, additional carbohydrates from soya, beans, or peas. Um, the situation is very different within a very short time of eating, the pH will begin to fall because the rumen microorganisms will digest the starch very quickly, producing um, uh, volatile fatty acids such as acetic, propionic, butyric acids. Now, I came across a paper the other day which showed that animals on this sort of diet had a pH of below six for around about 11 hours almost half the day, the digestion of fiber was significantly slowed. But worse than that, the pH was actually below 5.6 for just over four hours, which means there would be little or no fiber digestion going on at all. Um, and the net result of this is, I think, relatively poor milk quality with a butterfat of 3.8 to 4 at best, and a protein level of three to, uh, to 3.2. If we now look at what we mean by pasture, um, we mean grasses, forage legumes, herbs, flowers, forbs, grown together as a diverse mix. Now, part of our philosophy is diversity of the food sources that these cows eat. The PFL standards don't permit monocultures and we also ask that certified animals must always have access to multiple plant species. We do allow 
grazed brassicas, but they have to be grazed and not harvested. And they must be grown with at least other one other non brassica species. Um, they also need to have access to additional fiber. And we ask that they have a non muddy lying area to retreat to. We also allow whole crop and again grazed or conser conserved, it must be grown with at least one other non cereal species and it must be harvested or grazed before ear emergence. In other words, before you start to get starch formation in the grain. Um, a typical example of this um, would be oats grown with vetches, for example, which has the benefit of being very good for soil health as well. If we look for a minute at rye grasses, um, there are a number of characteristics of ripe grasses um, which we need to be aware of. There's a very rapid decline in the digestibility of rye grasses post ear emergence. The, nu the nutritional value of rye grass is at its best at the three leaf stage. As more leaves emerge, the older ones start to senesce and die off. So, um, and post ear emergence, you get lignification of the uh, stem and so on, which uh, results in a rapid decline in digestibility. They have relatively poor drought tolerance, um, a relatively poor disease resistance, and a quite poor trace mineral content. Um, whereas if we then look at diverse swords, and we're talking ideally here about eight or more different species, so there would be grasses, um, legumes, and a range of herbs, you'll find that the decline in digestibility through the season is very much slower. Um, partly because different plants reach optimum nutritional value at different points in the season, but partly because some of the plants will be her inherently more digestible. Um, you will usually find a higher protein content in diverse swords, and they are very much more drought tolerant because some of your um, legumes, for example, red clover and sanfoin are extremely deep rooted, um, as are some of the herbs such as chicory, um, so much more drought, drought tolerant. Um, there will also be a greater disease resistance, mainly because of the um, spread of plant species, that diseases of one plant won't necessarily be diseases of the plants adjacent to it and hence won't get carried over. The other thing you'll find is there's much higher trace mineral content, particularly in the herbs. Now, it, it's quite difficult to um, establish exactly what the mineral content of herbs are. Um, or should I say is, and the herb content of forage will vary enormously depending on soil type. Um, and we find that it varies quite considerably from field to field on a single farm. Um, but in general terms, herbs have the highest mineral content, legumes um, a bit lower, grasses a bit lower than that, and, and bottom of the list is maize, which has a very low trace mineral content. The other benefit of diverse swords is that you do have a higher dry matter intake. Diverse swords tend to be much more dense than ryegrass um, swords, um, traditional ryegrass swords which have been drilled. Um, and if you look at the way cows graze, um, it's not surprising that you get a higher dry matter intake from a more dense sward. If we then go on to the next one, for cows that are totally dependent on forage, of course, the yield is going to be very much lower, 3,000 to 3,500 litres per cow per year. And I can hear you thinking, well, how the hell are we going to make a profit from that? But those animals producing that level of milk are under much less stress than high yielding dairy cows and a number of benefits accrue. Now in 2017, 18, we followed three herds with 300 plus cows. 
And we found that for those three herds, the veterinary costs were very much lower than conventional costs, um, less than 20 pounds per cow per year. And I think in fact, the figure for these three herds was an average of 16 pounds 50. Um, the figure of 80 pounds per year was taken from Promar figures for that year. The other benefit is that a vastly improved fertility. Uh, on these three herds, 85 plus percent of cows held to first service. So this is, offers an opportunity for a very tight um, calving pattern and means that cost of fertility is much lower, nine pounds compared with 29 plus. That in turn, of course, leads to a much lower replacement rate. And we're looking at around 12% as opposed to 29%. Um, so there's a further cost saving there. Now, as a result of the uh, much lower yields, an improved fiber digestion as a result of a more stable rumen uh, pH, the milk quality is very much better. Um, the average butter fat was over 5% and the protein was over 4.5%. And in the year that we were looking at this, um, I looked at the figures in September and the conventional price for milk was around 22 pence per litre, uh, depending on the contract and, and the quality of the milk. Whereas these guys with um, pasture for life cows were getting 40 pence per litre. Um, some of these herds are only milked once a day, so there could well be some uh, labour saving there too. But the net result of this was that the margin per cow was £1,200 for the pasture for life herds, whereas the Promar figures for the conventional herds, it was £1,100 per cow. So these cost savings um, and the improvement in milk quality do compensate for that very much lower milk yield. Um, there are also human health benefits such as higher solids, omega-3 uh, levels, better omega-3-6 ratio, higher conjugated linoleic acids and so on. But this now is Hannah's um, area. So I will hand over to Hannah to uh, carry on with the next part. Thanks very much, Mike. If you can um, stop sharing and then we can move on to Hannah. Uh, I can't actually. Can you stop the sharing, Jimmy, please? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Great. Okay, Anna, over to you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mike. That was really interesting. Um, hopefully this will be an OK follow on. Let me share my screen. So I as Jimmy mentioned, my name is Hannah Davis and I am a lecturer at Newcastle University. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about milk quality under grazing-based management. Um, sorry, anyway. Um, so to start with, I thought we'd have a quick talk about what is actually meant by milk quality. We hear this phrase quite a lot, but it means something different to most people. So to farmers and typically the dairy industry, milk quality is generally more than 4% butter fats, more than 3.3% protein, and a somatic cell count under 200,000 cells per mil of milk. And I'm sure there are other things that you can think of which also uh, mean milk quality to you. But to consumers, it means something very different. Consumers are often looking for milk or dairy produce that is low fat or antibiotic free. Um, has a long shelf life. And more and more people are looking for what effect um, what they're consuming has on their health as humans, has on the welfare of the animals that are producing um, the dairy and the environmental impact. And so to researchers, again, it's sli something slightly different. So whilst yes, we're interested in these farmer and dairy industry and consumer priorities, um, these, we're also interested in the fatty acid profile and the micro and macronutrients. So that means that we view milk quality more from a nutritional perspective 
um, and evaluate it by the fat composition, um, which I'll come on to more in just a minute. Um, so why is it that milk quality is important? Well, currently in the UK, um, the typical diet consumes too much saturated fat and not enough polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically not enough omega-3 fatty acids, especially when that is compared to omega-6 fatty acids. Um, and currently the UK um, ratio for that is about 20 to one. And ideally we would have it down to sort of 10 to four to one. Um, but the milk fatty acid profile varies a lot. So it can vary by the diet, it can vary by the season, the management and the breed. Additionally, um, the UK does not have any premium for meeting certain nutritional content. Um, whereas in the US, there is the organic valley, um, the crop grass milk standard. But there are standards for farming, which bring in both the farmer and the consumer priorities. And as you can see at the bottom here, that could be Red Tractor, Soil Association, Soil Association Pastures for Life, RSPCA Assured, and I am sure there are many others. Um, but again, these don't necessarily offer a premium, whereas the Organic Valley's grass milk offers 15% above the organic price for meeting nutritional standards. Um, so again, I'm going to take a little step backwards um, and just have a look at what we mean when we say milk composition. So when we're talking about milk composition, we're talking about the polyunsaturated fatty acids, of which there are about 2.3% in milk fat. And these are further split up, as I just mentioned, um, to the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids. Um, then there are the monounsaturated fatty acids and the saturated fatty acids. And as you can see, dairy produce is, well, not, some dairy produce is much higher, but milk is 70% saturated fatty acids. Um, we then have the protein component, minerals such as calcium, selenium, iodine, and the vitamins. Um, and really these, they were, it's based on their chemical structure, um, why they're split into these different types of fatty acids. And many of these fatty acids in each class have a range of actions and effects. Um, so the early dietary guidance grouped and researched fatty acids of the same class, like the saturated fatty acids, whereas more recent research have started studying the impact of individual fatty acids for their human health, um, which is what we'll get to in a second. So I do not expect anyone to understand the chemical structure of the fatty acids, um, and nor do you need to, but just to give you a quick background, this is how they were split up. So saturated fatty acids on the top here, this is just one saturated fatty acid, but they have no double bonds. Whereas the monounsaturated have one double bond. And then we come to the polyunsaturated fatty acids, they have numerous double bonds. So linoleic acid has two and alpha linolenic acid has three. So these two fatty acids here, omega-6 linoleic acid and omega-3 linole alpha linolenic acid, these fatty acids are essential. We must have them in the human diet as we cannot metabolize them ourselves. So this is why these fatty acids are of particular interest because they are essential and we don't get enough of them. Particularly, we don't get enough of this omega-3 fatty acid. So what we did here at Newcastle is we set about researching if we can increase the amount of omega-3, the alpha linolenic acid, in the milk um, based on what the cows are consuming. So we studied milk from the PFLA um, dairy farmers, and we also took milk from organic supermarket milk and conventional supermarket milk. So we did have to make some assumptions based on the time of year, but we really the assumptions we made were based on the management practices typical of conventional agriculture, organic agriculture, and pasture for life. Um, and really the main difference between all of these is that pasture fed are predominantly, well, they're 100% forage or pasture fed, um, whereas organic goes down to 60% and convent or a minimum of 60% and conventional could be even less. 
So this alpha linolenic, acid, alpha linolenic acid, as I said, is an essential fatty acid, and it is the most abundant omega-3 fatty acid. And it's essential for brain development and supports healthy aging. And here on the right, we have CLA-9, which is a conjugated linoleic um, acid, and it's an isomer, and that isomer is called CLA-9. And that is linked to an enhanced immune response and has been shown to lower the risk of coronary heart disease. And as we can see here, so this image is taken um, from gas chromatography where we have extracted the lipid from the milk and run it through this machine. And we can see that the concentration of both ALA and CLA9 is much, much higher in the pasture fed compared to the organic and compared to the conventional. So we then, set about looking at a range of different milks. So we've got the 100% grazing as we saw in the last one, last slide, 90% forage, 85% forage, supermarket organic and supermarket non-organic. Um, so what we found is again, this omega-3, the most abundant essential omega-3 alpha linolenic acid had the highest concentration um, in the 100% grazing and the lowest concentration in the supermarket non-organic. And this linoleic acid, this is the most abundant omega-6, again, essential for human health, but when we think about the ratio and what's important with the ratio, we would like less of it compared to the omega-3. And we found that really it's a fairly straight line here um, where the, um, the least con or the lowest concentration of um, linoleic acid was found in the 100% grazing and the highest in the supermarket non-organic. So then when we come here to this ratio on the far right, what we see is the ratio is nearly, well, it's over double that of the supermarket organic and three times as high as the 100% grazing. Why is that important? Because they're both essential, right? So we need to eat more of them. Well, it's important because they use they have very similar metabolic pathways. So because of that, how they're metabolized in the body, they compete for the same enzymes for, metabol for metabolism. So if they're competing for the same enzymes, then there needs to be a similar amount of them for them to both be able to metabolize, be metabolized efficiently and effectively. So when this ratio is this high, you can see that it's much more likely that the omega-6s are gonna be metabolized efficiently and effectively than the omega-3. So what else can we do here other than just feeding 100% um, forage? If we look here at these long chain fatty acids, so these long chain fatty acids, uh, long chain omega-3 fatty acids, sorry, they are metabolized in the body, but they are metabolized from um, alpha linolenic acid. So if we don't have a good conversion rate of alpha linolenic acid, then we need to make sure we're consuming more of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And dairy is not known for being a particularly good source of long chain omega-3 fatty acids, but even though it's in a tiny, tiny amount, we can still see that the more forage there is in the diet, the more of these long chain fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids there are than um, the supermarket conventional. Um, and that's not in any way to demonize the supermarket conventional. It's just to suggest that the more forage there is in the diet, the more fresh grass there is in the diet, the more alpha linolenic acid there is and the more long chain omega-3 fatty acids there are in um, the milk. So I appreciate this is fairly sciencey and I apologize, um, but just bear with me for one more second. So what is the actual impact of changing your diet? What is the actual impact of going from more conventional milk with not much um, dairy in the diet to more grass milk in the diet? So this is the paper I was talking about earlier, or this is the grass milk that I was talking about earlier, and that's the American equivalent of the PFLA. Um, so in this paper shown here, Ben Breck et al, they modeled the total linoleic acid and the total alpha linoleic acid in the daily diet of moderately active 19 to 30 year old women across 36 diet scenarios. 
So 18 of those diet scenarios had typical high linoleic acid foods, such as regular margarine and other foods containing soy oil um, and things like that. And then 18 on this side, mostly identical diets with three foods that had lower LA content and they were substituted. So pita chips instead of corn chips um, and margarine made with canola oil instead of soy oil. Soy oil. So the 18 scenarios in each of these two cases had three levels of fat intake. So that's this bit up here. Um, so that's 20% of fat intake, 33% and 45% of the total energy. Um, two levels of dairy product consumption. So that's um, three and 4.5 servings of dairy per day and three variations of dairy fat. Dairy fat. So that's the cows managed under conventional, under organic and under grass milk. So what this showed basically was that switching from moderate amounts of conventional milk to high amounts of grass milk um, reduces the ALA to ALA ratio from 11.33 to 5.95. So that's a 47% reduction in the overall um, LA to ALA ratio in these women's diets. So what do we know? We know that LA and ALA are essential human nutrients and they both complement and compete with each other. And so this ratio matters. And the research suggests that large excess of dietary LA compared to ALA can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and other diseases. So this change is based in the USA and it would not be as significant a change if this was in the UK because our ratios were not as high in the UK. But there would still be, or there still is a significant change in the ratio going from conventional to grass milk. So um, let me know if you have any questions in the Q&A um, and thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Hannah. That was really interesting as ever. Um, I'm now going to play Becky's recording, so bear with me. Sorry, hang on a sec, I can't find it. There we go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person um, to take part in this great webinar. Um, it's really nice to be with you. Um, and I'm here just to talk to you a little bit about the case for carbon within pasture-fed dairy systems, where some of those emissions might come from, what the impact of that concentrate or water feed is in terms of its wider emissions, and what this might do in terms of affecting overall whole farm carbon footprints. So, yeah, well, I've not got a huge amount of time today, but I thought I'd just use some of our examples that we have from our work with farmers to really just highlight some of the key points um, where carbon makes an impact uh, in terms of your overall farm carbon footprint. Um, my name's Becky. I come from the Farm Carbon Toolkit. For those of you that don't know us, we're a farmer-led organisation really aimed at trying to provide practical tools and resources for farmers on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to understand how to build soil health and business resilience. Um, and so I spend a lot of time out on farm helping farmers really navigate this whole complex area of greenhouse gas emissions and carbon. And it's some of this, uh, this work and this knowledge that I'll be bringing this evening um, and using a couple of farm examples just to highlight a couple of 
key points um, that we need to focus on when we're thinking about the impact on our carbon footprint of the percentage forage within our dairy cows diets um, and that transition away from feed. So we really probably need to start by just looking about where those emissions come from within our dairy system. And, you know, this graph here, which has actually come from some work that ADAS has done, but demonstrates really nicely how those emissions that are associated with dairy systems break down. And what we need to remember at this point is that we're not just dealing with emissions from carbon dioxide through that burning of fossil fuels, which are generating that greenhouse gas. We're also dealing with those two other gases in terms of methane and nitrous oxide. And for us within agriculture, it's how those, those three gases, the complex interplay between those gases, which actually make up the overall, overall emissions from a farm. And we can see here that actually the majority of the emissions um, are coming from enteric fermentation. So that's that process by which our animals eat, eat food, um, and a byproduct of that fermentation of that food is obviously methane, which comes out the front end. But you can see there in that orange part of that pie chart, the next biggest source of emissions, which is very much coming from feed production. And so that for the majority of that emission is coming from the inputs that are going into growing that crop that's being put into it or being uh, made into a feed, the transport of it, the um, actual you know turning it into whatever blended or, or cake or whatever it is all of those have emissions associated with them and we need to be able to take account of that when we're doing our carbon footprint you can also then see the other areas on the farm so manure how we're managing storing and applying those manures use of fertilizer both to grow the forage that we have on farm but also any other any other things that are going in there uh, fuel use electricity and then all of the others which are, are producing a small amount of emissions so if we're thinking about mitigation options that we have on farm, anything that we can do to, re to reduce the amount of emissions that are coming from feed production is a really sensible strategy to do to look at how we can reduce our overall carbon footprint. And this is an example of a dairy farm that we've been working with um, and their carbon footprint. It's not a massive dairy farm, it's about 200 cows. And you can see that this blue chart over here shows you the breakdown in percentage of emissions from those different categories across the farm. So you can see that we've got fuels, obviously materials, inventory, so that's carbon costs associated with tractors, machinery, crops, inputs, so that's fertilizer, and then this category, livestock. And you can see from that table there that actually livestock is dominating the emissions on this farm. It's providing just under 85% of emissions coming from livestock. What's quite interesting though is that that livestock category is actually masking a couple of different things. So if you look at that pie chart on the right there, you can see that, as you would expect, um, for a 250 cow dairy unit, um, a lot of those emissions are coming from those animals themselves. But what's also hidden within that 85% that is the emissions that are coming from those feed products that are being fed. And we can see here that actually 30% of those emissions on this farm that are coming from that livestock category, it's about 735 tonnes, is coming from feed. So on first examination of this, this blue table over here, you can say, well, the cows are the issue. But actually, when you delve into a little bit more detail, you can see that actually anything you can do to reduce the amount of bought in feed that's coming in is not just beneficial in terms of reducing cost but it's also beneficial in terms of reducing our overall footprint. So just to compare that, here's another example of a farm, which again is another dairy farm that isn't bringing in any additional feed. So you can see that not only has the percentage of overall emissions gone down, the value has gone down as well. So it can be something that can be really useful in terms of looking at reducing emissions. Another really important thing to remember here is the difference between per product and whole farm footprints. Now, any of you dairy farms that you may well have had some footprinting done for you as part of your milk, milk processor, a lot of those calculators are really measuring on a per product basis. So the results that you will get will be per litre of milk, per kilo, you know, all those sort of things. 
And so one of the strategies that's often often used um, to help reduce emissions is to actually improve your production. Because if you can improve your output in terms of litres of milk, your carbon footprint per litre of milk can go down because you're spreading those emissions over a, over a larger litreage, as it were. But this sometimes can be a little bit problematic because one, it means that sometimes one of the things that's often ad advised to farmers is to, you know, reduce the forage and actually improve the concentrate because that actually drives production. But that what that can do is actually mean that we've got a slight distort distortion of the footprint. And so sometimes if you look at things over a whole farm footprint, rather than just focusing on a per product, you can actually start to assess the impact of everything that's going on farm. And you can then start to understand the impact in a bit more detail of how you manage your grasslands, how effectively and how efficiently you use that forage resource that you have so that you can then start to drive efficiency. And also look at the benefits that come from sequestration. Now, obviously we've been doing some work with the Soil Carbon Project um, and we're starting to understand and unpick that detail and that data in a little bit more detail. We seem to be able to see a difference in that soil organic matter and soil carbon content between grazed grass and cut grass. So fields that are predominantly used for grazing tend to have a higher organic matter content than those that are just, cut, just um, used for cutting. So again, that animal impact is actually showing a benefit in terms of soil carbon. And obviously if we can then assess that soil carbon, it can also help with that overall carbon account in terms of providing sequestration. But actually how you manage that grass is very important. So looking at the impact of not just the grazing method, but also how you're managing that grazing that you have and optimising the efficiency of use is really important. And again, we're then able to model that within the calculator so that we can not just, in, we can not just see the emissions reductions that are coming, we can also look at improved soil health. So that's been a bit of a canter through very quickly. Um, and again, I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions after this session. Um, but just in summary, making the best use of forage is beneficial in terms of those whole farm emissions. So it really provides an opportunity to reduce emissions. Potentially, it also then allows for some differentiation in the future between biogenic emissions and fossil fuel derived emissions. So I'm sure most of you will have heard about some of the uh, new work that's going on, or not very new work that's going on now, looking at the impact of methane. If we can start to differentiate between the emissions that are coming from the animals themselves, so those biogenic emissions, and those emissions that are coming from the feed that we feed our stock, which are more fossil fuel based, then we can actually start to understand that in a lot more detail. And if we can adapt those, those biogenic emissions by using things like GWP star, it more starkly makes a contrast with the fact that actually anything we can do to reduce those feed emissions will really have an impact. And to make the most of that system and to get them maximise the carbon benefits that you can get, it's really down to management. So again, making sure that you've got efficient grazing management, looking at what's going on with manure and fertiliser, because that will allow you to maximise the sequestration benefits as well as drive those emissions reductions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to Becky, wherever she is. I thought that was fantastic. And I think that last point on the difference between biogenic and fossil fuel emissions is so critical, particularly at a policy level. I think the scientific community is unanimous that burning fossil fuels is causing climate change, but somehow the cow has ended up as the bete noire. Um, so finally, but by no means um, leastly, over to Bronwyn on the marketing aspects of all of this. Excellent. Okay, let me just share my screen here. All right, I'm hoping that you can all see that lovely cheese rind that I'm starting out with. Um, as Jimmy said uh, slightly earlier, my name is Bronwyn Percival and I work as the cheese buyer and sort of technical manager for Neil's Yard Dairy in London. So I'm not a farmer, but my work takes me into that interesting space between farming and, um, and customers and particularly in the context of cheese, which is what I work with every day. And I think it's a really interesting question we've seen over these last 
um, three really interesting presentations about a really strong case for how boosting forage in the diet of ruminants is good for animal health, it's good for human health, and it's good for the environment. And I guess the question that I want to address within this presentation is, is the impact of those that change to feed the animals more forage and more diverse forage something that we can actually taste? Um, so I just want to start with this idea that actually cheese making itself is farming on three different scales. And, you know, on the first scale is what the Pasture for Life Association is really focused on, which is this idea of farming, um, you know, biodiverse, complex pastures, and then feeding that, um, so farming for the plants, and then getting those plants into ruminants, um, who can be farmed for meat or for milk. But essentially, we've got the macro level of the plants. We've got what I'm thinking of as the meso level with the ruminants that you're then farming. Um, and then finally, we've got for the for these farms, they are ultimately the main product that's coming from them, although many of them may produce meat as well. This ideal farm is actually also producing milk, which is then turned into cheese. And I think it's important to think about cheese making, the process itself, as also a farming process. And we're farming for diversity and, um, you know, selective environment to promote the kind of microbes that are going to turn our milk into delicious cheese. So um, just Cheese making in a 30 second um, summary uh, is a process where we take milk and we remove all of, well, almost all, a great percentage of the moisture. So we remove on average about 90% of its weight, the liquid fraction, and we um, concentrate the solids, the milk fats and, and proteins, which I'm sure everyone who's a farmer is very aware of. Um, and at the same time, the milk itself is, um, during this process, is acidifying. So we are essentially coordinating, when we make cheese, a process of drainage of all this moisture out of our curds in, as, as well as a fermentation step. And how you coordinate those two processes gives rise to the enormous variety of cheeses that we see in front of us. And one of the reasons that I think that cheeses are so amazing is because they really, I think, much more than liquid milk, give us an opportunity to taste a farming system. And I'm not saying that if we took milks from a bunch of different types of farms in different places, um, we wouldn't be able to, if we put a selection of those milks in front of a sensory panel and ask them to taste them all side by side. I'm not saying that we wouldn't see that they were able to detect differences. Um, I think people can detect slight differences in either the sweetness, the richness, um, the, the um, maybe some flavors in the milk that have to do with whether the cows or the goats were uh, eating, you know, garlic or brassicas. All of those things can affect the flavors of milk. But I think when we look at the spectrum of flavors of cheese, we can see and we can see scientific evidence for the fact that those differences in flavors between farming systems and between locations are absolutely magnified in the form of these finished cheeses. And that's a process that's stewarded by sort of two levels of impact of the farming system. Um, the first that I'm going to talk about just briefly is the um, the microbial side of things. And then the second side is really the um, you know, the pasture biodiversity side of things and whether actually feeding more forage as a percentage of the whole and feeding more complex sort of more species forage actually is something that we can taste in those cheeses. So this is a very um, confusing and busy French slide, which I think, um, you know, it was adapted from a book that was written by French cheese technicians to help um, farmhouse producers start to understand the microbial communities of milk and to start look, looking at what they call the reservoirs of microbial diversity on the farm. And so I think not that we need to go into this in any great depth, but I think the point that it communicates very clearly is that this is a really complex system and microbes are everywhere in our environment. Um, they're on the herdsman's hands, they're in the water, they are um, in the, you know, in biofilms on the milking equipment, and they are particularly on the surface of the teeth. And all of these different reservoirs are potentially um, places where 
microbes can get into the milk and how farmers then manage their systems, what kind of farming system they're running, whether they're milking once a day or twice a day, what sort of bedding their animals are on, all of these things has an influence on what microbes are therefore going to be populating that milk and then have the ability to grow within the cheese. I should say a quick aside, um, I'm talking primarily about raw milk cheese here. So cheese that has been made without a from milk that has not been pre-treated with heat to kill um, potential pathogens. Pasteurization involves heating milk for 15 seconds to 72 degrees Celsius um, or some other heat treatment that gives an equivalent effect, but essentially it wipes out the majority of the bacteria of, um, of cheese making interest, particularly the lactic acid bacteria that we're also interested in. Um, there are some microbes that survive the pasteurization process. So I would say all of these things are still definitely relevant to pasteurized cheeses, but I think the, the optimal is that we're talking here about milk in which the microbial communities in the raw milk are allowed to grow as the cheese is being made and to really flourish and um, express the true totality of the farming practices on the farm. So this is just a snapshot really of what all of the factors that might be looking, um, that might come into play. And so, you know, I think again, bringing us around to this question about, you know, here we're talking about feeding forage and feeding a greater proportion of forage in the animal's diet, what possible role does that have to play in the microbial diversity of the milk that's going into the cheese? And I think the interesting answer to that is there's a lot of evidence that it plays a big role in that microbial community, that cows or goats or sheep that are spending a lot of time outside are actually in contact with this environment. Um, if, the, if the animals are inside in a zero grazing system, they're going to be lying down on a very different surface than they are when they are out in the field. And actually it's interesting, but perhaps not surprising that the leaves of plants are one of the natural reservoirs for natural strains, you know, um, naturally occurring strains of lactic acid bacteria. And so if the cows have lay down on a biodiverse field, there's the possibility that, you know, a very few, we're not talking about high levels of bacteria that are naturally living on the surface of these grasses, but very low levels. But the thing about microbiology is you only need one microbe and to put it into a conducive environment and exponential growth means that if that microbe is well suited to the environment that you've provided for it, it can grow to dominate a community very, very quickly. And so in a, in a system where the animals are being exposed to a lot of these grasses, you have a lot of potential um, roots of, and I, you know, I use the word contamination here in a positive sense, roots of inoculation of these, um, these microbes into the milk. And actually, it's really interesting on this, in a study that they did in Normandy, um, a group of scientists looked at a couple of different farms and really did a deep dive into the um, communities of lactic acid bacteria in these milks that were going into making raw milk camembert. And what they found was that in a lot of these milks, there were actually strains present that hadn't ever been recorded for and weren't in the government reference laboratories, but that these farms, farming really carefully and holistically, were actually um, propagating their own unique strains of lactic acid bacteria, which then, of course, becomes very interesting from a cheese making view if we're trying to taste the character of the farm through this fermentation and cheese making process. Um, so what we can see is that the mil raw milk, when left to its own devices, good raw milk will sour on its own. And so this is just a quick slide showing some of the tests that some cheese makers um, do called a lacto fermentation, where they actually put samples of their raw milk with no starter cultures, nothing added to it, just the fresh uh, milk from the morning, and in this case, the evening milking as well. Uh, incubate it at a temperature that's comfortable for lactic acid bacteria to grow and use it as a sort of early warning system as to the quality of their milk. Um, and so they can see changes throughout the year. They can see changes when the cows are outside grazing or inside uh, over the winter, uh, the influence of feed, all of these things. This is a sort of hypersensitive barometer to what is going on within that milk community. And some farms who do this actually take it a step further and they ferment a larger proportion of the milk and they have it for breakfast every morning on their muesli. And their point is, if it's not good, you're going to be aware of that in a real hurry and you're going to want to do something about it because um, if it's unpleasant to eat, it's a sign that there's something going on and you want to know about it as soon as possible. So that said, there are lots of ways that we, with our best intentions in the, um, in the modern farming and cheesemaking world, can actually get in the way 
um, of the expression of these microbial communities. And we have to be careful that even cows or animals who are outside in the most pristine conditions can have the roots for these bacteria um, into the milk that we want to have there, essentially blocked when we throw things in their direction like um, intense chemicals designed to kill the microbes on the outside of the teat. The, the, the surface of the teat, in addition to grasses, is one of the key locations for na naturally occurring lactic acid bacteria. Um, and so teat preparation becomes very important to allowing the transmission of this sort of farmed microbial character in the milk. Unfortunately, because we've all been raised in a world where the best milk is the cleanest milk, um, a lot of, and people are paid a premium for having milk. You know, we talked about what's the definition of quality milk. Another real big definition of quality milk is milk with a low total bacterial count, which may be true for if you're going to be pasteurizing liquid milk to have a very long shelf life, you do want to start with a very low total bacterial count. That will improve your shelf life. But if you're aiming to get the best possible cheese, and particularly raw milk cheese, throwing chemicals at the teats like this is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Um, instead, we can look to places in Europe that have been making cheese um, with a sensitivity to their raw milk microbes for maybe a little bit longer than um, we have, uh, and some practices there that are designed to clean the teats while preserving the microbial community. And so the use of wood wool is a perfect example of this. It's just sort of dry wood shavings. They're very abrasive, but they're all but soft at the same time. And they also really encourage milk letdowns. So actually you can milk the animal um, more quickly. I think the, the astute farmers amongst us will say, well, that's fine, but that is the absolute cleanest udder I've ever seen in my entire life. And if a cow is coming in caked in manure, you're, a little bit of wood wool uh, around the teats is not necessarily gonna solve that problem. And I think that is an illustration of another really important point about farming for microbes, and which is essentially that it demands certain farming practices and rewards things like extensive systems where the animals aren't too crowded together and where they do stay clean. And again, this has direct implications for, you know, whether cows are living indoors um, in close proximity to one another versus being outdoors on pasture where, you know, particularly if the weather is dry, there's every probability that if they went out clean, they'll come back in clean and it opens the door to using methods like the wood wool because everything in the farming system is already orientating those teats to be clean and have a healthy population of microbes. So I want to move on to the second question, which is in terms of concentrates, um, can we taste, you know, we can we can measure with our, we can measure scientifically very clearly a difference in the composition of this milk, um, the ratio of the um, omega-6 versus omega-3 fatty acids and so on and so forth. We can measure those differences, but are they things that we can taste? And I think one of the really important things to note, and this is a slide that's courtesy of um, some of the more extensive dairy farmers that we work with, Andrew and Sally Hatton, at, um, at who make a relatively new cheese called Stonebeck Wensleydale in the Yorkshire Dales, is this really interesting idea that as milk production goes up, um, you know, as Mike said, we're limited if you're feeding an entirely forage-based diet to what I considered now to be very low um, total yields. Um, per lactation per cow. So, you know, this starts at 4,000 liters uh, per lactation because I guess they can't imagine anything less than that being possible. But, you know, going up to 9,000 and, and levels of 10,000 and above really are not uncommon on a lot of dairy farms these days. But what you can see is that as that, as the milk yield goes up, it's really impossible to get 9,000 liters of milk per year from forage. And um, so you're relying more and more on concentrates to provide the difference. And that means that essentially the proportion of the milk that's coming from forage is essentially going at decreasing and decreasing in line four here as the milk production increases. And what we can say is that in systems where more and more forage is fed or more and more concentrates are fed, it definitely changes with the with the fats in the milk changing and so forth, those give rise to different characteristics of the cheese. In many cases, say if you're feeding a lot of maize silage, it's well proven that those cheeses are going to be harder and they're going to be lighter colored, sort of whiter, less yellow than cheeses that are made from a more um, forage rich diet. And I think, again, these French studies that have been done, because a lot of money has been thrown about out at this in France, is 
concluded very sort of clearly that um, the texture, the taste, the aroma of cheese, all of these things that we as consumers are interfacing with on a very personal level, you know, we don't need a spectrometer to tell us this, these things that give us joy about the cheese, the way that the, the composition of the animal's diet really, really impacts those things that we can taste. And I think that's at once a very um, alarming thought and a very exciting thought if we're looking for, um, you know, to value these things that um, are also good for animal health and human health and the environment, that actually what we could be painting here is not just a pretty story, but a story that we can verify for ourselves with our own taste buds. And that gives us pleasure um, while we're consuming it because we can taste the difference essentially. So again, the, the, if you're going to be running a system where you're feeding mostly forage to dairy animals, your animals are probably not going to look like what we think of as the prototypical dairy cow these days. And I think it's very interesting, again, to look at the most extensive farming systems that are doing dairy in France and the UK and see how, you know, how stocky and how low yielding the and how hardy and thrifty these animals actually are. This is a salaire cow that we met uh, in the Auvergne. She was 22 years old and had had quite a few calves over that length of time. I'm sure over her lifetime, she had given a fair amount of milk, but the most important thing is that she was doing it on an entirely grass diet and providing some uh, milk for her calf at the same time. It was an incredibly um, efficient system and one that made an absolutely spectacular cheese. Likewise, we have these um, northern dairy shorthorn cows, a critically endangered native species or na native breed of cow to the UK. They thrive up in the pretty harsh um, climate uh, and uh, in the in the Yorkshire Dales, they do not, you know, they probably give about as much milk as those cellar cows in the Auvergne, but they are able to do it on an almost completely forged diet. And as a result, those cheeses have the textures and the flavors that we associate with being um, primarily pasture fed, which is really exciting to taste. Um, so I think I'm just going to finish up with this idea of this sort of chain what we're calling the cheese biodiversity chain, but which originated as something that was called the eating biodiversity chain from a scientist at Exeter called Henry Buller. And he sort of, he did some um, research, particularly successfully with meat and whether people, like whether extensive farm management practices fit within a, within a system that would actually reward people for doing things in a way that was ultimately more expensive. So in our cheese biodiversity chain, we spent this whole time talking about the farm management practices that we, um, that Pasture for Life stands for and, you know, gradations. I don't think we have to look at this as a, as a very black and white thing. Gradations that involve moving away from excessive concentrate use and towards more um, forage and pasture-based diets, particularly where we're looking at pasture species diversity in terms of the plants, but also farm microbial diversity. That gives rise to differences in animal feed composition and milk microbial composition. Again, that it allows us to have the fingerprint of the farm that it was made on. And when that cheese making is done in a way that is sensitive and allows those flavors of the milk to shine through because you have a big hazard and um, the potential to use strong starter cultures, pasteurization, and, you know, throw everything you can at it and actually make a, a, a milk from, or a cheese from interesting milk that um, fails to express the potential of, of that milk and just make something that tastes like anything because it was made in an insensitive way. But when those things are, when, when the cheese is made sensitively, I think it's pretty clear that we can get a cheese of, of a quality that is very high, that's delicious, and that also can't be made any place else. And that translates into taste. And ideally, because at the end of the day, People are coming to our cheese counter for multiple different reasons, but a, a big one for us is, you know, we're not generally tending to sell cheese with a lot of extraneous, what we consider extraneous, but, you know, discuss information about the farming system or um, the, you know, the breed of cow or any of this other information. We're selling it according to how it tastes. And I think 
our, our customers, by and large, they probably are interested in many different things, but at the end of the day, they're selecting the cheeses they're going to buy off our counter based on the way that it tastes on the day. And they're willing to pay more for cheeses that taste better and more interesting. And that economic viability then means that more money is going back back onto the farm to be plowed into these farm management practices, which then again creates a virtuous circle, which uh, over time I think has the capacity to reward farmers for farming in this way that really boosts the intrinsic natural capital and natural value of their farm and supports rare breeds and all of these you know public goods that we're also looking for in addition to delicious cheese. So just to finish off, oops forward one side. I want to finish with a picture of a cheese just made on an experimental basis. This is a very old fashioned Stilton that was made experimentally on someone's countertop. And I think one of the really interesting things is that it's a proof of principle that here is interesting milk loaded with native microbes that have been harnessed in a sensitive and interesting way. Absolutely no microbes, either bacteria or molds have been added from off the farm. And you can see that when the cheese is built right, that milk had everything that it needed from the rind microbes to the blue mold that was gonna grow on the inside to really turn it into an absolutely beautiful and profoundly delicious cheese. And I think there's a lot more in this area just waiting to be discovered in the coming years. And um, I'm really looking forward to being along for the ride. So thank you very much. Thanks, Bronwyn, and wonderful to end on such a positive note. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but my mind is, is bulging after listening to four really fascinating um, presentations. And I suppose I feel one, one thread that seems to weave its way through all of this is, is diversity. And I think that's something that the PFLA really champions. And we were even talking the other day of making it the focus of our AGM this autumn. Um, we've got about 25 minutes to handle some questions. So I hope to be able to get through all of them. Um, there are lots of them. And I think maybe I might start by coming back to Mike, who's been quiet for some time now. Um, and there's a few for you, Mike. Um, the first one I might just pick up because it's, it's quite a specific one is, does the rumen pH, if it goes above 6.8, cause problems? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure to be uh, honest about that. I think the likelihood of it going above, uh, much above 6.8 is fairly small because the microbial population in the rumen is very diverse. And under normal circumstances, it would be pretty stable. Thank you. Um, and then also another very specific question about the, the, the 40p price you mentioned. Was that premium to conventional, which I think you said was 20p, was that due to the milk solids, which were elevated, or the fact that it was organic, if it was organic? Um, in that particular instance, the milk was going for cheese making. Okay. So that was a, a price per litre for cheese making um, because of the very high uh, solids content. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps I'll bring you in, Hannah, now. Um, a question from Glenn Boyd about the composition of grains in, in the diet. Um, hmm. uh, let me just get it up. So it's, I've got it up if that helps. Um, so said, did, does the comp composition grains being fed to conventional cows have much of an effect on LA to the ALA ratio? Um, I don't think, I'm not sure, but I don't think that there would be much of a difference in the ALA um, or the LA concentration between organic and conventional grains. Um, and I'm not sure that that would be different between countries either the difference comes between the different grains if that makes sense um and i think this comes on to oh it's your next question as well in pasture fed cows if grass is heading um and coming to seed how much does this have an effect on the ratio so that's where the ratio comes in so typically the leafier and greener it is the more ala it has um and that does differ between grasses, legumes, and forbs or herbs. Um, and then as it um, grows more stemmy and becomes more fibrous, the ALA decreases. 
and the LA increases. So then as it comes to a seed head, that is when there is a higher LA concentration than ALA. And I saw your question a minute ago and actually pulled up some information that I had in my thesis. Um, so predominantly, the fatty acids that we find in grasses and green things is um, of the fact it's ALA, LA, and palmitic acid, and that's about 60%, 20%, and 17%. But when that comes to cereal lipids, um, that completely changes around and becomes, um, still has some, sorry, becomes much higher LA, so that goes up to 60% LA compared to the 60% that it was in the grass, um, and 20% of palmitic acid. So big change when it goes over, when it comes to a seed or when it turns to a grain. And then that sort of carries on to, sorry, Jimmy, I'll, I can segue this neatly into another question if that's okay. Um, this segues quite nicely into one of the other questions that talked about, um, I can't find the question now, but I will do the segue anyway. Um, <laughs> So this then goes into, um, oh, I've lost the question now and I've lost my own chain of thought. Well, I, I, there, there was a question I was gonna ask, which relates to the PFLA's kind of, one of the PFLA's research ambitions is where, where are you going with all this research? Because I think it's quite clear that we're, we're beginning to see some exciting answers in all of this, but mm -hmm. we need to do a lot more work looking at different farming systems, drilling down into some of the questions that are being answered here, which, probably there aren't answers to all of these questions because the research hasn't yet been done. I mean, one of them that, that comes back to my previous point was around diversity and some of the recent research that you and Gillian have done that shows that the greater the, diver the, greater the diversity, even within a 100% pasture-fed system, leads to even better results. And this is all stuff that needs to be looked into. Yeah, this is the stuff that I really enjoy. Um, even the grazing rotation. So the more sort of the more diverse, the better, because they move through the rumen differently, as Mike might be able to attest to. Um, so if the clover may have slightly lower ALA concentration than the grass, um, but it moves through the rumen faster. So that means that there's less biohydrogenation, which means that it gets to the rumen in, it gets to the mammary gland intact. Um, rather than being biohydrogenated in the rumen, which means that more will arrive in the mammary gland, thus in the milk, um, than it would have otherwise. Um, and I've remembered where my segue was. It was into the question about why it's different in the American samples than in the UK one, and that's because of corn. Um, so corn syrup, corn grain, super high in LA um, and lower in... Um, ALA. So that's why the concentration and that's why the proportion of LA in the US diet is so much higher than in the UK because we do not consume corn syrup and we don't, well, very low amounts. Um, and we just have a much lower diet of omega-6 in the diet. We might have a much lower concentration of omega-6 in our diet um, than typical US diets, but we still have a higher concentration of or higher content of omega-6 to omega-3 in our diets. Um, so yeah, there's lots of, lots of interesting research going on with grazing management, diversity of swords, um, breeds and the best breeds, the different management um, and how that all works together to produce a more nutritious product. Thanks, Hannah. Um, what, one quick related question from David Harding, which relates to how the different milks in your study were processed, as in were they all heat treated to the same level, homogenized, etc. Past year. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no. Um, they weren't. The supermarket ones were all homogenized and pasteurized. Um, but I did some research to make sure that this was an okay study to do. And from what I have found and what I have understood is that pasteurization and homogenization change um, can change the protein and they can change the milk fat globule size um, but the overall proportion of fatty acids in the milk does not change because of those processes. Thank you very clear and I think that then brings me on to 
another related question which John Thorns was asking about, which we can bring Bronwyn in on as well, and I think maybe Hannah and Bronwyn can answer this, is what happens when you make cheese? What, what happens to all this nutrition through the cheese making process as you're losing all that moisture, you're losing the whey? Um, has anything been done, if, if either of you know, whether it's in France or the UK on this question? Anna. <laughs> I can speak to what, so I, we set up a study to do last, oh, time has just passed ridiculously, a year and a half ago, we set up a study to do with a, two of the PFLA farmers um, in the UK, um, but COVID just meant that we just weren't able to do it yet. So as far as fatty acids in the cheese, there is some initial studies and they're typically looking at sort of organic and conventional and a couple of different management, but we haven't looked at 100% pasture fed yet. But Bronwyn, I'm sure you can speak to that in more detail. Yeah, no, I mean, I think one of the one of the things is there are lots and lots of different cheeses, and depending on the make, you might be treating those curds in a very different way. But I think the the similar thing throughout all of them is that you're trying to keep as much fat and as much protein in the curd as you possibly can, because if you're losing it in the way, you're undermining your entire economic argument for making cheese. You want to you want to keep a hold of those fats and proteins, and you want to damage them as little as possible. My sense is that if you're pasteurizing. Um, you know, if pasteurization doesn't impact the fatty acid balance within the milk, that the actual cheese making process, at least in the very early stages, is not likely to do that either. But how, say, through that fermentation and then the, the through particularly later on when you have the microbes releasing their enzymes that start to go to work on those fats and proteins, particularly re really lipolytic um, enzymes that are say predominant in something like blue cheese and give you all those sort of ketone flavors. I'm sure that is having an impact then you're getting a lot of free fatty acids that you can absolutely taste. I mean, that's one of the things that tastes so strongly in blue cheeses in particular free fatty acids. So clearly there's some fat breakdown going on nutritionally, the impact that I have uh, that that has, I have absolutely no idea, but yeah, there's a lot of work to be done there. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Thanks Bronwyn. Um, another question for you which I, I think you, you have partly covered in your talk, but there are a couple of people have been asking about what, what do we need to do to get the customer to buy into all of this? That's a question that I've been thinking about a lot over the past few years, because particularly, well, I think I see that if, that there are so many things that can lead to change and we need all of them working simultaneously to actually help us get from point A to point B in terms of very intensive farming to um, a different style of farming, which I think is has a huge amount of potential in all these different respects. Um, I think one of the one of the key things to me is making the flavor argument. Um, and of course I would say that, but um, you probably know the food writer and chef Dan Barber at uh, who works in New York, um, Blue Hill. And he said something that really struck a chord with me um, a while ago, which is if you want to change people's behavior, you have to be a merchant of pleasure rather than part of an army of virtue. And I love the idea that, you know, there are all these, there are all of these social goods that come out of the buying of this style of cheese. But at the end of the day, if you're going to convince a large number of people that they want to get involved with this, it's probably going to be by appealing to their sense that this is delicious and well worth the money because it's going to reward them with instant gratification. And if there are all these other social goods combined with it, then like so much the better. But I do think that leading with that is a really powerful thing to do. And I also think where it becomes more complicated is it's completely possible to trick the system. You know, there are a lot of cheese starter cultures that you can add to cheeses, which essentially create these really sort of, for example, Right, Bronwyn's gone. I think we're going to segue. Um, and hopefully she comes back. Um, there were a few related questions, some of them in the same question about what the key shifts are for farmers. And we have done a bit of work on this in the PFLA. And the thing that came out top every time about how we transition the dairy industry to pasture fed practices was mindset. Um, and I did also see a question, I don't know if he's still on from Dan, Burdett on here, who's recently completed um, a Nuffield scholarship on 
the role of mindset in transitioning to regenerative practices. Um, and Dan, your question was around carving, which is another one of the, the barriers that we see in um, farmers transitions. Uh, and your, your question was around, uh, would it be possible to run a pasture fed herd carving in the autumn? I don't know whether that's something Mike you could answer. I mean, I probably would say that that was gonna be a question I might've put to Dan next week because he's on the panel uh, at the session at Groundswell. But Mike, if you did have a question, a, a, an answer for that, then please um, go, go for it. Um, well, yes, of course it would be possible to have an autumn carving herd. It would mean that you're going to be much more dependent on um, good quality uh, forage from diverse pastures. Um, I suspect it would have an, an effect on the milk volume produced. I suspect that the volume of milk produced might be um, a bit lower. Um, I'm not sure how it would affect quality. Um, it's possible that there might be a slight improvement, I don't know. Um, but providing you're able to make uh, an appropriate quantity of good quality conserved forage, um, I don't see why um, you can't do it with an autumn carving herd. Uh, and then also, I mean, maybe we will, you know, we will pick this up next week when we discuss the kind of the practicalities in more detail for, for, for those of you who are there. One next quick question for you, Mike, um, in what you were showing there, was there a cell count increase on the once a day milking? I mean, maybe that's also a question for Brian. I, yes, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have any information on that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't um, record cell counts, so I'm sure they would be available on that farm if we went back. Is I can possibly answer that if that helps. Um, yeah. I looked at two of the farmers that I worked with um, were once a day milking and the others were twice a day milking and they were, I think there were six or seven of them. And there was not a difference in the cell count. Bronwyn, so anything you want to add in there? N is low, but there wasn't a difference. Sorry, Bronwyn. I would say my the, that my anecdotal evidence uh, sort of suggests the, shape, the, the same, but it's my N is even lower, I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were a couple of questions, which I think ultimately would have gone to Becky, who sadly isn't here. One of them was about sequestered carbon and the role this might have in addressing whole farm carbon budgets. I think the, the evidence that I see is it's still a bit early to say anything there with, with any kind of real confidence. Um, where I'm coming from, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of debate around the role of soils capturing carbon. The debate seems to be on how long they can keep it, and part of that clearly relates to management. And then the other debate is around depth, and most soil carbon analyses only go down to 30 centimetres, and one of the big frontiers is how low can it go, effectively, to use a, a kind of horrible phrase. Um, and so I think, I think we, will, we will find more in time. It, it's something we're working on extensively at the moment through our research group, through particularly EU horizon projects that we're getting involved with. So I think it's a, it's a really kind of interesting area. Um, Andrew Ross asked a question directed to Hannah about which supermarkets in London sell grass-fed milk. I can probably answer that myself. I don't think any of them do, sadly. And I think it, it, you know, it relates to some of the other questions we've had about the consumer and, and how we get people to buy into this. I think at the moment, most 100% grass-fed product is being sold direct. Um, you do see raw milk um, seeming to gain some traction. Bronwyn also sits on the Raw Milk Producers Association Technical Committee. Do you have a view on raw milk as, as, as perhaps a kind of gateway drug to, to, to raw milk cheese? I mean, raw milk, raw milk consumers are highly motivated people. So we, you know, we like them. Uh, it, as I said, you know, in my presentation, raw milk is a very, very different product than raw milk cheese, and it has very different risk factors. I think it was a sort of um, bet noir for the uh, FSA until quite recently, but I think it's been a very good example of how a producer's group can work with the, um, with the regulator to try to establish some good baseline um, best practices and then grow from there. And I wonder if there are opportunities for PFLA to do similar things with say rules about butchering of animals that are older than 
you know, older than the stated norm right now. But yeah, no, I think um, it's it's frustrating for me too about the grass fed milk thing because I would definitely buy it for myself. And even in this highly, you know, dairy enriched environment, I can't, you know, easily get a hold of it. So I should probably come in and say that we do have um, a couple of 100% grass fed cheeses out there. One is made using milk from two pasture for life farms, Horton House Dairy in Wiltshire and Matt Bowley's in Somerset, and that's being made into a cheddar by Lie Cross, which gets sold um, all over the UK. And then also we have the Ethical Dairy up in Galloway, who makes um, a cheese which they primarily sell direct. Um, a question here again to Bronwyn on, uh, well, for, from John Thorns on what effect cow calf systems, you know, sharing the suckling, sharing the milk, does that have any effect on the cheese? That's a really interesting question. And I think as people are starting to, you know, a few people have started to experiment with this um, with variable results. Um, the big impact that lots of people talk about is a decrease in the milk fat percentage um, in, the, in the milk that's coming from these cow calf systems because the cows don't let down their milk as completely when they're in the milking parlor if they aren't with their calves and they're used to suckling their calves. And, you know, as a, as a recent mother, maybe this is too much information, but, you know, milking with a milk pump and, mil and nursing an infant are two completely different things. And I can completely understand how that works and how um, in these mixed systems, you could be getting milk, you know, from, from the cistern of the udders of these cows in particular, which is very, you know, if they don't let down that rich hind milk, you're going to get low fat milk. And as a result, the cheeses have a tendency to be very kind of low fat textured, very crumbly, very rubbery, um, very chewy, very slow to break down. I think that there are probably ways around this. Certainly that salaire cow I showed a picture of, that is a cow, that's like the original cow calf system. And they actually bring the calves to the cows while they're being milked and that helps promote the letdown and they have delicious and very high, you know, high, high fat cheeses that come from that. Um, I've heard similar things about decreased fat content in sheep's milk when they were doing a, you know, a system where the lambs were allowed to nurse for 12 hours a day. Um, I'm not sure, I'm sure that there are ways to, I, I don't want to be defeatist about this though. I think it's a very, very interesting concept, particularly where people are doing once a day milking. And um, I think we just don't quite know all of the ways to get the best out of it yet. Right. Do you have a sense if you're milking once a day and you're giving your calf some, whether whether actually that kind of bolsters milk production because there's more of a demand on it or whether that, that cuts your cloth even further? My guess is that it's probably somewhere in between. I bet you get more milk total, but I would imagine that you probably get a little less for yourself than you would if you weren't sharing it. But, you know, Possibly, I, I would imagine someone like Mike or, or Hannah might know more specifics about that. That's just based on a, on a guess. Either of you want to pick, pick that one up or pa pass? <laughs> it's uh, mostly to do with, um, yeah, with your management and your breed um, and even the time of milking. So I know some farmers who um, will let the calves run with the cows during the day and then the calves will go overnight into a shed and then the cows will be milked in the morning. Um, so yeah, I think what Bronwyn said is right. And I think there's additional um, management caveats in there too. Well, a few questions on the kind of starting to make these changes and what, what farmers can do, what, what people can do to get involved. I mean, I, I suppose as a hard sell, I would say join the PFLA. The, the people talking on this panel are all involved heavily with the PFLA. And I think that is really representative of what the PFLA community is and does. It's a, it's a means for people to come together and share best practice and learn together and make some of these changes so that we can all benefit from them. And I, I kind of mean that in a kind of societal sense as well. Um, another very specific question for Bronwyn around the use of iodine uh, for teat prep and whether that was a legal requirement and if, you know, if it's not. No, uh, it's uh, using iodine for tea prep is not, and even pre-dipping is not a legal requirement or post-dipping. I think the, the legal requirements have to do with the outcome, which is very much the way we like it because it gives us the ability to experiment and develop um, you know, develop practices that are capable of doing you know, something to the same standard, but better, <laughs> but with extras. 
Um, and so, yeah, no, there are no, there are no legal mandates. There, there might be mandates for people who are selling their milk to um, milk cooperatives, for example, that they want things done a very particular way. But in terms of an overall requirement, no. Uh, another question for you uh, around, well, I mean, it's from Stuart Meekle, and I guess it relates to if, if you had to draw up a, a list of the forages you wouldn't want to see in, in, in farming for cheese making, what, you know, is it rye grass? Is it um, maize? How, how, how would you approach that, trying to kind of rank them? It's a very interesting question. And I think the answer is what is the outcome that you want? I think there was a question within that about silage as well. And I might just share my screen quickly because I pulled up a picture of the impact of feeding silage on particular kinds of European um, hard low acid cheeses. So let me just share this quite briefly. Can you see that? Yes, we can. This is called the late blowing defect. And this is the reason why Parmesan makers and Comte makers and everyone else are so afraid of silage is because silage um, can harbor these butyric acid bacteria, which are, you know, you can make cheese fine. It, there's nothing wrong when you, when you make the cheese, but then as the cheese matures, they gradually like inflate because these bacteria as they grow release hydrogen gas and butyric acid, which um, tastes like vomit. I mean, the cheeses are unsellable. So that's the reason why so many, so many um, cheesemakers, particularly sort of cooked press cheesemakers, are terrified of silage. In the UK, our cheeses have evolved to um, to cope with that through the addition of salt through the curd and also a higher level of acidity. So we feed silage and make cheddar and other you know acid acid British cheeses with with no problems as a result. In terms of what's the best cheese, what's the best feed in a sort of hierarchy to make the most expressive cheese? I think the first thing I would say is if you can have something that involves forage with high biodiversity, whether that's hay, whether that's, you know, um, you know, whether it's hay, whether it's grazed directly from the field, um, depending on the kind of cheese you're making, probably I prefer a biodiverse silage to a simple like monoculture of ryegrass that was grazed in terms of the potential, because a lot of the, that biodiversity brings with it these compounds called aromatic compounds called terpenes, which are essentially the components of essential oils that are naturally found in these plants. And they do come through into the milk and the way in which they impact the flavor Flavor of the cheeses is a subject again of great study, but it's it, there's a lot of evidence that they impact the flavor of the cheese that comes out in multiple different ways. Um, and so, to graze straight rye right grass, there are no terpenes there, and so you're missing out on that extra element of potential complexity. Thank you for that. Um, if the panelists are happy to hang on for five more minutes, I think we can get through the final questions. Um, one. Mm -hmm. Hannah, that I know you said you were going to answer. So from Frank Smith, does the nitrogen in the legumes affect the methane production in the rumen? Um, so from what I understand of the rumen microbiome is that it will adjust to what it is being fed and then it will go back to its baseline. Um, and there have been so many studies at this point that have tried to do all these different interventions and with the rumen to reduce um, methane emissions through algae, through various different various different feeds. Um, some of them last three weeks, some of them last three months. Very, very, very rarely they last a year, but in nearly all of them, by the very end of the trial, the rumen has gone back to its baseline and is emitting the same amount of methane as it was before. So, does the nitrogen in the legumes affect the methane in the rumen? Yes, but <laughs> probably not for long. Um, if the, the, the rumen has the microbes that it has and it will almost definitely go back to how it did. We can breed for more efficient dairy cows. Um, we can be more efficient with our production systems and the more efficient we can be, the less, the fewer, the less emissions there will be. Um, so really it's about breeding in that efficiency and working out how to be more efficient both with the rumen and with your management and that will reduce emissions more than um, the methane production from the legumes. If it's, you know, if you're feeding 100% clover, that's going to really upset your cow's rumen, yes. Um, if you're, but if you have some clover in the diet, 
yes, that may increase emissions temporarily, um, but it's not going to have a big effect. Also, if you're doing that, there'll be other there'll be other differences. So if you're doing that, maybe the grass will move or the clover will move through the rumen more quickly. If you're moving feed through the rumen more quickly, does that mean that the cow is going to be more hungry more quickly? Or does it mean they're going to be less hungry? So they're going to be eating more because of what you're feeding them. So therefore, are you reducing efficiency or increasing efficiency by feeding them more? Um, so lots of things to think about. And I, I, yeah, sorry, that question could easily derail my thought process. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a quick one for Mike about, I, I guess it's about the relationship between organic and pasture fed. What, why, aren't organ why aren't more organic dairy farmers moving towards 100%? Well, um, the requirements for organic is that you need a minimum of 60% forage. And I think some of them um, are moving in the pasture fed direction. Um, but I think you know that that to give up using concentrates altogether um, is a big step and i don't think many of them are quite ready to take that step at the moment um thanks mike quick question at the end from kerry haywood does anyone have any experience with pasture fed dairy goats we do now have our first certified pasture 100 pasture fed dairy it is also horton house in Wiltshire, who are providing the milk, who are providing the cow's milk for this 100% um, pasture-fed cheese. Uh, we can certainly put you in touch. They're very open. It's their 18-year-old daughter who's managing the goats and all of that side. Um, quick question from John Thorns. We make alcohol from our whey. Could you look next at the benefits in the alcohol from using PFLA milk? Who wants to pick that one up? What would you expect to find in the alcohol? Maybe the terpenes? I mean, that's an interesting one. If you can show the terpenes, like these aromatic molecules, which is exactly what you would then be infusing into gin, actually go into the milk, which they do, then it's interesting. I don't know how soluble they are, whether they stick to the fats, whether they come out in the way. If they did come out in the way and they were still there, I mean, then you could, you know, distill the sugars that, you know, the, the sugars that you'd fermented into alcohol, you could distill that. I think that probably the levels of terpenes in the milk are so low <laughs> compared to what you would need to be able to taste, but it would be kind of cool. We've often thought that it would be really neat to do one of those whey um, gins, but then infuse it with the botanicals from the pasture so that you have like a, an ex another expression of that one place or one field, you know, forget juniper when you could do um, all of your own botanicals. But I don't think that getting them directly from the way would be the most efficient way to do that. Um, another one for you, boy, in fact, the last two ones look like they're for you, Bronwyn. Um, is the microbial community on the teat that you mentioned something that would show up in the SCC count? Yes. Oh, no, SCC. No, it wouldn't. So SCCs are immune cells. So that's coming from within the, the within the udder. They would show up on the total bacterial count, though. So it's another reason why, you know, maybe the the standards that are the most like the that are really good for liquid milk aren't necessarily the ones that are good for cheese. That said, the whole point about exponential growth also applies to the milk for cheese that you can have really interesting, good, diverse milk with a low total bacterial count. It doesn't have to be super high to start out with to be good. But no, not SCCs, but yes, total bacterial count. And then finally, when you're pasteurizing, which is clearly happening a lot in the West of the country with TB, um, which aspect of the cow's diet would still affect the milk taste through that process? that's a that's a really i think almost i think a lot of the dietary stuff would still come through in that milk even if it were pasteurized like pasteurization shouldn't affect things like the the amount of the the color of the milk will be unaffected i think um and also um like it, so from a from a composition point of view like carrie said it sounds like a lot of those fatty acids aren't necessarily broken down or impacted by pasteurization so that would come through You've got the, probably the terpenes would come through as well, but also there are some thermoduric bacteria, which is an interesting. So bacteria that are actually heat insensitive and survive pasteurization. And a lot of those are actually the bacteria that we associate with washed rind cheeses. So like the sticky orange ones, a lot of those are heat insensitive and can survive pasteurization. So again, there's a potential link with the place 
that you could still express even if you were pasteurizing your milk. Thank you. We've got to the end. 30 questions wow. out. Well done. Thank you to the three of you and thank you to everyone who joined. Um, I think this was a really fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you all did as well. I will finally say again, please do, if you're not already, join the PFLA. It's £100 a year. This is just a sniff of what you would get if you join. There's so much amazing things going on, so many amazing things going on at the moment on all fronts. And it feels like now is the time. So join us and deal with these issues. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Nice to Bye. see you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.